Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I don't know about anybody else, but it still makes me just very excited to be in a room with other human beings. <laughs> so I, I understand this is the first time we've been able to do this live and in person in a couple of years. So welcome. It's uh, really a thrill. Um, so as Ellen said, my name is Danny Hoffman. I'm the interim director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies here at the University of Washington. And it's really my pleasure to be able to welcome you here tonight to the Griffith and Patricia Way Lecture and our special guest speaker, Dr. Philip Lipsy from uh, the University of Toronto. Now, b before I begin, I want to take just a second, and as we do before all of our public events at the, at the Jackson School, and recognize that we are in Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, Sequamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and other indigenous peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, First Nations, and indigenous peoples across the world. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, the Jackson School and the University of Washington have a very long and important relationship with Japan and with Japanese studies. In 1909, the university established what was then named the Department of Oriental Studies, the program that has grown and become the Jackson School of today. And one of the things that I find very exciting and unique about this school is that that origin story really remains an important part of the school's identity. We do a lot of things in the Jackson School, but the fact that we still have a vibrant Japan studies program that constitutes a core piece of international studies is something that we're very proud of and that we take very seriously. So Japan studies is a program that in many ways really models what we try to do across the full range of the Jackson School. I think we're all committed to the idea that the most effective approach to understanding world events is to understand the diverse languages, cultures, histories, political and economic systems that intersect every day around the globe. And I'm, I'm very fortunate in this year that I get to see that commitment every day uh, in the work of our students, our faculty, and our staff over in Thompson Hall. And the fact that you're all here tonight, I think, demonstrates that you too recognize the value in that approach and recognize the special role that Japan Studies plays in the Jackson School at the University of Washington and in our community. And I want to thank all of you for valuing that kind of engaged scholarship and for your continued support. Now, with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Marie Antrodogi, uh, who chairs both the UW and Jackson School of Japan programs and who holds the George Long Endowed Professorship. Marie specializes in the political economy of Japan, and her research is focused primarily on the key institutions and policies of Japan's capitalist system, particularly how the government and the private sector are trying to build up strong ecosystems for startup companies. So, thank you. Greetings uh, to you all, and thank you, Danny, for your introductory remarks. Um, we're really glad that you've joined us here today for our annual Griffith and Patricia Way uh, lecture series. We're so happy to be back in person, uh, but we are recording it because we know some people will prefer to watch it that way. Um, so it will be on our website, you know, in the next month or so or a few weeks. While Griff and Pat passed away a few years ago, I'm sure that they are with us in spirit uh, this evening, and we're joined by their son, uh, Bill Way, and his wife, Mary Way. Um, through the generous support of friends and the Way family, uh, this endowed lecture series is now in its 17th year. Uh, while some of the world's attention has moved towards Ukraine and U.S.-China conflict, this endowed lecture series lets us have a community event once a year focused on some aspect of Japan. For those of you who are not familiar with the Ways, let me give you a, a little bit of background about them. Griff and Pat were lifelong advocates of supporting and promoting knowledge and appreciation of all things Japanese, from art and language to law and politics. Griff was a native of Seattle. He had served as a Japanese interpreter and translator during World War II. His language skills ultimately actually saved thousands of lives during the invasion of Tinian Island in the Mariana Islands. Pat was also raised in Seattle. She's a graduate of UW, but her education was disrupted uh, during the war when she was selected by a very highly regarded Japanese language training program uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Griff and Pat were both selected for this elite program to learn Japanese, and they were on the train to Colorado, met each other, and the rest is history. While Griff was sent to Asia, 
Uh, Pat actually spent the war time in Washington, D.C. She worked at the Office of Naval Intelligence and Naval Communications. They married in 1946 and were married for nearly 73 years. Their passion for Japan became a strong thread that continued throughout their lives. They decided early on to use their knowledge and time to help establish some key organizations to help others learn about Japan. In the 1960s, Griff, who was a UW law alum, helped professors here create UW's Asian Law Program, which was the first academic program on Asian law in the United States. He also helped found the Society for Japanese Legal Studies in the 1960s, which had UW publish a journal for several decades called Law in Japan. In 1974, he actually wrote the founding documents for the Journal of Japanese Studies, the legal incorporation documents, and the journal is still the top in its field. And he was on the journal's board um, for over 25 years. As a member of the Jackson School Visiting Committee, for several decades he offered his uh, wisdom and he also gave sage advice to chairs like me of the UW Japan Studies program. Griffin Pat were very generous in their financial support of both the Jackson School and Japan Studies. Griff also understood the importance of keeping critical institutions alive. He was a great believer, for example, in the IUC, the Inner University Center for Japanese Language Training in Japan. This was established in the 1960s by UW and several other top US universities. And the IUC is the closest thing that exists to the type of intensive language training that Griff and Pat got in the Navy Language School during the war. Almost all of our Japan faculty have gone to IUC and many of our students uh, have also gone there. And I know one that's going next year that was just accepted. In the early 2000s, what happened was the Japanese government drastically cut funding for the IUC, leaving it basically on the verge of closing. Griff, as trustee of the Blakemore Foundation, at that time insisted that all Japan Lakemore Fellows go to the IUC language program, basically keeping it alive until more recently some big donations have come in to put it on solid financial footing. So just as the Navy Language School had changed Griff's and Pat's life trajectories, Griff wanted that opportunity to be available to everyone. His support greatly impacted the lives of many IUC students, past and future, um, which really most of the academics on Japan, lawyers and business people, most of them have gone to the IUC. Pat and Griff also built up an excellent collection of modern Japanese art, some of which they gave to the Seattle Art Museum. So Griff and Pat are outstanding role models for all of us, and not just for their contributions to Japan. They were people of action who took time out of their busy career and lives. They were raising four kids. Uh, they took action to use their own knowledge, their social networks, their resources to make a big difference in the world. For this, as well as their exceptional integrity, uh, empathy, generosity, and humility, they remain great sources of inspiration. And this lecture series helps keep their legacy alive. It's now my great honor to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Philip Lipsy, who has been a rising star and is now a star in the Japan field, uh, starting some 15 years ago. Professor Lipsy is professor and chair in the Department of Political Science and in the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. He did his undergraduate and master's degrees in economics, politics, and international policy studies, all at Stanford. 
and he got his PhD in political science at Harvard in 2008. He was an assistant professor at Stanford before he moved to the University of Toronto in 2019. And as you can see here, he's just added another position um, in the Graduate School for Law and Politics at Tokyo University, where he is teaching a course uh, every year. He's a fellow at John Hopkins SICE Initiative for Sustainable Energy. He's director for the Center for the Study of Global Japan in the Monk School and is a council leader in the US-Japan Council. I only have limited time to touch uh, upon his many publications. His first book, Renegotiating the World Order, Institutional Change in International Relations, came out from Cambridge University in 2017. And he's working on a book manuscript called tentatively The Institutional Politics of Energy and Climate Change, which is what he'll talk about tonight. He has two co-edited volumes, one called The Political Economy of the Abe Government and Abenomics Reforms, which he co-edited with Takeo Hoshi, and another titled Japan under the Democratic Party of Japan, The Politics of Transition and Governance, co-edited with Kenji Kushida. He has published many articles in top journals, such as the Journal of Japanese Studies, uh, International Organization, Asian Survey, and the American Journal of Political Science, as well as numerous book chapters. He's also been very active in writing for policy journals. I've been very impressed to see that too, Philip, uh, writing articles for foreign affairs, foreign policy, the diplomat, uh, and the like. He's held many prestigious fellowships, including the Insight Development Grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the Abe Fellowship and Japan Foundation Fellowships. So please join me in welcoming Professor Philip Lipsy to the University of Washington to talk about stagnation or renewal, Japan's energy and climate change policy. Well, thank you, uh, Danny and Marie, as uh, well as the Wei family for making uh, this possible. That was uh, too kind by far. Um, I really uh, appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, they didn't uh, let me know that I would be competing with cherry blossoms in full bloom uh, when uh, I, I was coming out, uh, but I'm impressed that you're all nonetheless here. So what I uh, can't uh, compete on in terms of beauty, hopefully uh, I can do on intellectual engagement. and other things. Um, so let me begin the talk with a little bit of uh, a story. So in 1997, uh, UNFCCC delegates gathered in the ancient Japanese capital city of Kyoto to negotiate uh, the first major international agreement to try to address climate change. Uh, and of course, this became known, as many of you know, as the Kyoto Protocol. And during this meeting, the Japanese government, of course, as hosts, played an active role in trying to get uh, the agreement done. But it was also an opportunity to showcase some Japanese technology. Uh, of course, Japan had responded quite effectively to the oil shocks of the 1970s and had prided itself on various energy-saving technologies and practices. Uh, Toyota actually expedited the production of the Toyota hybrid Prius uh, and showcased a model at the Kyoto meeting. Um, so this was a bit of a, an opportunity for Japan to shine, to uh, showcase both its achievements, but also to take uh, a leadership role in this new global challenge, which the international community was finally addressing quite seriously. However, if we zoom forward about a decade or two, these are the kind of newspaper headlines you would see. Uh, the Independent in 2010, Japan derails climate talks by refusing to renew Kyoto Treaty. 2021, Japan wants a leader on climate under fire for coal use at COP26. 2022 Kyoto News, Japan given infamous fossil award at climate change conference. 
And this has essentially been the narrative over the past 10 or 15 years or so. And if you look at Japan's actual track record, this is a figure that shows uh, the difference between the commitments countries made under the Kyoto Protocol and their actual achievements. And the only really important thing here is this one right here. Uh, so Japan, in absolute terms, was the worst performer within the Kyoto Protocol. They essentially had to uh, pay some of the countries over here using flexibility mechanisms, essentially transferring cash to uh, Russia and Ukraine and other Eastern European countries to get their excess emissions down to their actual uh, commitment uh, levels. So this was considered a bit of a fiasco uh, by both Japanese policymakers, uh, an embarrassment, as well as international non-governmental organizations that were very critical of Japan's performance. Um, a further illustration is the Yale Environmental Performance Index, which ranks countries according to how well they're doing on climate change policy. This is the 2018 edition, where Japan ranked number, under, number 116, two places below the United States, which was led by uh, this individual down here at the time. Uh, of course, Japanese leaders will never say things like this, but in terms of what they were actually achieving in terms of policy, uh, they were actually not being uh, very proactive, not producing solutions to uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and so the puzzle that emerges here is that, of course, Japan emerged as legitimately an energy conservation leader after the 1970s oil shocks. This is real, right? You can look at the data. They were actually doing quite well. But since the 1990s, uh, they've actually lagged. They haven't been able to make equally impressive progress. So what happened? And what potential lessons may we be able to learn for climate change mitigation efforts in other countries, and of course for Japanese policy moving forward too. So it's useful to begin by reviewing the previous track record. What did Japan do to succeed in the 1970s after the oil shocks? So this is a figure of Japan's total energy supply by the type of energy source the country has used all the way back to 1960, uh, roughly to the present. And what you see is in 1973, when the oil shock happened, Japan successfully reduced its increasing reliance on oil. After that, uh, the amount of oil Japan has imported has essentially flatlined. So this is why Japan's response is oftentimes considered a policy success. And the way Japan did this was to expand into all other types of energy resources, for one. And nuclear was a big part of that. And we'll obviously come back to nuclear later. But another key thing about this figure, as you can see, is the rate of increase of Japan's energy use was bent considerably in a flat direction. Right? So if Japan had continued on this trajectory, it would have been using a lot more energy than it ultimately did. So a lot of what happened was the Japanese people were able to develop economically and maintain a relatively rapid rate of economic growth, at least for this period. Um, without increasing their use of energy very much. And that's called energy efficiency, right? So creating the same amount of economic output without using as much energy. So Japan uh, was a little bit of an energy efficiency superpower. So as recently as 2009, which is when this figure was created, Japan led the world in terms of energy efficiency. This is GDP, a measure of economic output. Uh, divided by total primary energy supply, how much energy every country uses. So Japan was able to create a lot of economic growth without using much energy. And if you think about it, that is an excellent way to think about resolving climate change. If we can all live our lives and be as productive as ever without using much energy, then we're halfway to solving the problem. Now, how did Japan achieve this? So we can look at several conventional explanations. So one that is quite popular is that this was basically an industrial policy achievement. And this is timely, perhaps, because today we're often talking about green industrial policy. Maybe this is uh, revisiting industrial policy is what we need to do to uh, solve climate change today. 
And this narrative focuses on the role of elite bureaucrats, particularly at the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, METI, uh, now called METI. They had a little bit of a rebranding. Uh, <laughs> But essentially, they're quite similar today as well. Um, and uh, you know, the, the story here is that essentially, by coordinating with Japan's businesses, Meti, Miti was able to engineer uh, very strong improvements in industrial energy efficiency, that Japanese industry was able to incorporate better technology, better practices, and they were able to use less energy and produce as much as they were uh, before. However, if you actually look at the data, and this is a measure of energy efficiency in the manufacturing sector, where the thick line here in the middle is Japan, and several other high-income countries are listed alongside, what you'll see here is it is in fact true that after the oil shock, Japanese energy efficiency did improve. However, Japan does not stand out in any way compared to other countries in terms of industrial energy efficiency. Uh, there are quite a few countries that were ahead of Japan, according to this measure. And today, most countries are clustered roughly in the same general uh, level of industrial energy efficiency, partly due to pressures of globalization. So it's hard to explain Japan's energy efficiency achievements using an industrial policy type of story. Another explanation could be something about Japanese culture, that basically um, the Japanese people are more culturally attuned to nature or care more about environmental preservation, energy conservation. You could go back to the Tokugawa era and uh, observe how they took very good care of their forests and so forth. And certainly if you watch Japanese television, you know, they'll have programs about how you can use your rice cooker in creative ways to save electricity. And so there's, you know, there is certainly something to this. Um, but if this was the explanation, one thing we should be able to observe is that energy efficiency should be uh, fairly consistent. If it's cultural, it should be pervasive and everywhere. Um, but this is not what we find. As I'll talk about later, uh, there's been some variation over time in Japan's energy conservation. But you can also point to the services sector. right? So this is the same data on energy efficiency for the services sector. And here, Japan is actually one of the worst performers. Um, and so, you know, if it's cultural, then there's no good explanation for why in one sector uh, the Japanese people should be wasting lots of energy. And, you know, you can point to things like, you know, this has gotten better in recent years, but it used to be the air conditioning would be blasting and it'd be very cold and the doors would be open and the lights would be always on and so forth. And so, you know, the cultural explanation also doesn't seem uh, very plausible. A third explanation could be, well, maybe it had something to do with technology. And certainly, this is the kind of image that Japan likes to promote, as we saw in that Toyota Prius example. Uh, here's former Prime Minister Abe driving the Toyota uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicle Mirai that hasn't sold many units, but is, is sort of a favorite um, point of promotion for the country. And so here, the argument would be something like uh, the Japanese people uh, tend to save energy because they use very energy efficient products, appliances, cars, and so forth. Um, and again, there is some truth to this, right? If you look at fuel economy, the Japanese people very consistently buy cars that are much more fuel efficient than Americans do, for example. However, um, this also doesn't account for the differences in Japanese energy efficiency compared to other countries. So, with a co-author, Lee Shipper, who is a very famous transportation expert and physicist, um, I actually did uh, a very careful investigation of energy efficiency in the Japanese transportation sector. And what we found is that it's true that Japanese cars are energy efficient at the point of purchase. Right? So on the sticker, it'll tell you this car is very energy efficient. But when you look at how much gasoline Japanese people as a country burn to get around, um, there's not much difference between America and Japan because Japanese cars are often stuck in traffic, stop and go traffic, very slow moving, whereas American cars are usually on a freeway. 
and it's much more energy efficient to be on a freeway. And so if you account for the kinds of travel that these cars perform, it turns out there isn't much difference. So surely it's better that Japan tends to purchase energy efficient automobiles, but that doesn't account for this national level difference in Japanese energy efficiency. And so what's the story? Well, this is a figure that actually comes from METI, uh, a 2019 energy white paper. And it's complicated, but the story is quite simple. So it's basically what's called the decomposition of why does Japan do well on uh, CO2 emissions, and why does it not do so well? And basically, the far out you go on this figure, the more Japan is doing better. Japan is this red figure here, right? And so Japan does really well on household sector efficiency. So this is in households, less energy is used compared to other countries. In transportation sector efficiency, so in moving around, right, people use less energy. Um, and industrial sector efficiency, as we discussed, not much difference. So Japan, Japanese industry isn't much better than other countries. And where Japan is seriously not doing well, is they burn a lot of CO2 in generating electricity, or they burn a lot of fossil fuels, which generate CO2, and uh, they also burn a lot of fossil fuels in doing other things, including uh, getting around. So this is like automobiles, for example, right? Um, and so basically, the story has to do with households and transportation, this very diffuse form of energy use. And you can dive in a little bit more and see these trends. So this is data that I collected with Lee Shipper, which puts out how much, how far do people travel in each country and how do they travel on a yearly basis, right? So Japan is right here. So what this figure shows you is that in Japan, the average person travels about 10,000 kilometers per year total, going to work, traveling for tourism, and so forth. And of course, Americans travel a lot more. Uh, and Europeans and New Zealanders and Australians are somewhere in between. But the punchline here is that on average, Japanese people travel less in total and are much more likely to travel using rail and bus transportation and less likely to travel in an automobile. So Japanese people are much less likely to move around at all, uh, which means less energy use. And if they do move around, they're likely to hop on a train. And a train is a much more energy efficient solution than burning gasoline in a car. And you can tell a similar story about household energy consumption. Uh, I won't go into the details, but again, Japanese people tend to use a lot less energy heating and cooling their homes compared to certainly Americans, but also uh, people in other uh, wealthy societies. And you might think, well, maybe this has something to do with geography, right? So one idea is, well, Japan is a small country, so maybe people don't have to travel very far. But if you line countries up according to land area, Japan lies below the line. So even accounting for the fact that Japan is small, people travel far less than you would expect. And well, you might say, well, maybe it has to do with population density and urbanization. A lot of people live in Tokyo, so maybe they can ride a train. Uh, but if you look at uh, urban population density, Japan is way off the line, right? So compared to other countries that are equally urbanized, Japanese people are much more likely to hop on a train than counterparts in Europe or North America. And so what's the story? And so in a 2012 article, I argued that this was made possible in part by something called efficiency clientelism. And this is basically the marriage of two key objectives. The first one was energy efficiency after the oil shocks. So Japanese policymaking elite said, we need to get off of our addiction to oil. We need an energy policy that makes it possible to do better and clientelistic redistribution, which means the government tried to uh, support itself by redistributing uh, money to core uh, political supporters. And how this was done was basically the government imposed very high costs on energy consumption by the general public. So things like gasoline taxes, electricity prices in Japan were very expensive, and intentionally so. 
and the revenues and economic rents uh, that were generated from these policies were redistributed to targeted groups that were supportive of the Liberal Democratic Party, the LDP, which was in power. Um, and by the way, it funded some very nice uh, retirement positions for bureaucrats. I won't talk about that too much today. But basically it benefited both the ruling political party, bureaucrats who are designing these policies, as well as very concentrated interest groups that supported the po political party in power. Uh, so a good example to illustrate this is the Promotion of Power Resources Development Tax of 1974. This was enacted right after the Arab oil embargo that caused the first uh, oil shock. And you can see the two objectives neatly in one package here. So the measure was explicitly created to promote energy efficiency and, and energy security. Uh, so the rationale here is let's encourage energy conservation by raising the price of electricity. So if we raise the price of electricity, people will use less of it, and that means we don't have to burn as much oil. Um, and now let's also use the revenues that we raise from these taxes to uh, invest in alternative power sources. And at the time, this was nuclear. So if we use the money to build nuclear power plants, we'll have to import even less oil. Right? So this is the energy uh, aspect of the policy. But there was also a redistributive aspect to this policy as well. The revenues, of course, they're going to nuclear, but they're also being redistributed specifically to uh, entities like large utility companies, TEPCO, KEPCO, and so forth, rural residents, the construction and infrastructure sector, and various nonprofit entities that sprung up that end up being staffed by current and former bureaucrats, particularly from METI. So you have these two objectives of energy conservation and redistributive politics combined under a single policy. And you can tell the same story. I won't go through all of them, but another example is highway tolls. Right? So highway tolls, if you've ever lived in Japan, are comprehensive and they are the most expensive in the world. Right? And you can see what this does. Right? So if you compare a cost of a trip from Tokyo to Osaka, you know, this depends on exchange rate fluctuations and so forth, so it's purely illustrative. Um, but if you drive, you pay about the same amount in tolls as you would pay to ride the bullet train. And driving costs, uh, you know, you have to account for gas, so it costs more, and it takes longer. It takes about seven hours compared to about two hours and a half for the Shinkansen. And you just compare this to San Francisco and Los Angeles, where, you know, there's no tolls. So we just pay the cost of the gas, it's about six hours, and the Amtrak costs more and takes about twice as long. So it's no wonder that people typically either fly or drive if they're making this trip, well, they'll hop on the bullet train if they're making this trip. And so the incentives are stacked in favor of uh, hopping on the train, and this is true in urbanized environments like Tokyo as well. It's very expensive to own and operate a car in Japan. Um, and so I won't go through this figure in detail because it's intentionally meant to be complicated, but there were very complicated schemes to take the revenues from things like the automobile acquisition tax, the diesel tax, the local road tax, and so on and so forth, and send them over to things like local municipalities, prefectures, and the road improvement special account, which is basically an account that was used to invest in infrastructure projects with a very heavy tilt towards rural areas. And so the punchline here is these kinds of policies uh, create incentives uh, to, uh, you know, uh, towards very different kinds of society. So if you have rush hour in the United States, it's more likely to look like this, and rush hour in Japan is more likely to look like this. Both extremely unpleasant experiences, without question, but this is much better for the environment, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think you'd want to be in either situation, you know, pushed into the train uh, or whatever this is over there, I don't know, 11 lanes. Uh, but, uh, you know, the punchline is, you know, this, this is much better if you are caring about things like reducing your reliance on Middle East oil or trying to reduce CO2 emissions. 
Another quirky example is something called K cars, K jidosha, uh, which are very lightweight automobiles, essentially unique to Japan. No other country has this class of automobiles called K cars. And they were specifically designed partly to, um, for protectionist purposes, uh, to carve out a little bit of a niche for certain Japanese automobile companies. But they're very targeted to Japanese rural areas. And K car subsidies are designed so that they're much more beneficial if you own a K car in a rural area. And you can see this in the data as the population density uh, goes down, K car ownership tends to uh, go up. And so the idea here is uh, you subsidize lightweight automobiles in rural areas, and so you help these rural supporters of the LDP, but also encourage them to drive cars that burn less uh, gasoline. And again, so this creates a situation where the rural transportation modes in the United States typically look like this, right? Giant SUVs and pickup trucks on the one hand, and in Japan, it's much more likely to look like this, where you have very lightweight uh, automobiles. And the financial incentives are very much stacked in that direction. So to summarize, energy policy in Japan before the 1990s uh, looked like this, right? So the highest prices in the world, the absolute highest for diffuse energy use, things like owning and operating an automobile, electricity prices, natural gas heating, uh, still very expensive, in fact. And these are induced by policy, right? It's not the market mechanism raising these prices, right? There's explicit policies in place to make these prices expensive so people use less energy in their day-to-day -day lives. And thus, you have lower energy use by diffuse uh, energy consumers. And uh, as a result, at the national level, you have greater energy efficiency and lower greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, they weren't thinking about greenhouse gas emissions at the time, but if you look at Japanese emissions, they're actually flatlining after the 70s. So Japan was reducing greenhouse gas emissions even before it was popular. Um, and of course, finally, the most important bit here is this was a very politically attractive strategy for the LDP because it allowed them to generate revenues that they could use for redistributive policies that made sure that they were uh, secure in power. And this was a very good policy mix for the kinds of political institutions that Japan had at the time. So what happened? Why, why, why did this all uh, fall apart and become less effective later on? So Japan underwent a series of political changes starting in the 1990s. In 1991, as some of you may remember, there was the bursting of twin bubbles in real estate and equities that marked the end of the era of Japanese rapid growth, right? Japanese growth stagnated. Some people call this the lost decade or the lost decades, depending on how long you think it lasted. Um, and at the same time, you have a series of political shifts. In 1993, the LDP falls from power for the first time uh, since the beginning of the so-called 1955 system. Uh, in 1994, you have reform of the way politicians are elected, electoral system reform, as well as campaign finance reform. And these have the effect, essentially, of increasing the political influence of diffuse consumers, precisely the kinds of people who are paying high costs under the previous system and reducing the power of concentrated interest groups, the kind of actors who are benefiting from the previous system. For the political incentives are shifting away from the kind of arrangements that Japan was using to promote energy conservation. In 1998 and 2001, you have administrative reforms this elevates the role of politicians relative to bureaucrats, and particularly the role of the prime minister uh, against uh, other politicians and the bureaucracy as well. And of course, the bureaucracy was also playing a very important part in the management of these kinds of redistributive uh, and energy efficiency arrangements. So the punchline is uh, today, politicians in Japan are more sensitive to the cost concerns of ordinary Japanese citizens and there are very strong pressures to dismantle precisely the kinds of arrangements 
that I described that were core to Japan's energy conservation policies. So there's been a big shift in the political context and the political institutions. And you can see this almost immediately, right? Reformist politicians uh, from both the LDP as well as parties aside from the LDP are attacking high energy costs throughout this entire period. So in 1994, under the first non-LDP government, uh, Prime Minister Hatta, uh, he was only in office for about two months, so he didn't do very much. But the one thing he did do was he froze increases in electricity, natural gas, and various transportation charges. So almost immediately after these changes happen, you see a freeze in the potential increase in these energy prices. The LDP comes back to power, and in 1996, uh, you have Hashimoto, prime minister, uh, engaging in structural reforms to reduce fees for electricity and gas. So essentially, it's not bipartisan because there's more than two parties, but cross-partisan uh, in these efforts to reduce uh, energy costs. Koizumi, of course, the well-known maverick reformer, uh, went straight after uh, the transportation aspect of uh, these policies, right? He considered this to be uh, corrupt, that basically we're taking money from ordinary people and sending them to these opaque organizations and infrastructure firms, and this needs to stop, right? We need to reform this and make it more transparent. The DPJ government, which is the next non-LDP government to come to power, very prominently campaigns uh, we're gonna eliminate the temporary gasoline tax that was implemented after the oil shocks, we're gonna eliminate highway tolls, and we're gonna make automobile ownership much cheaper. Right? So this whole series of political reform proposals is focused on dismantling, essentially, the core source of Japan's energy conservation policies. So here's the DPJ campaigning in 2009. This here says, Gasoline nesage, which is reduce the price of gasoline by 25 yen. Very um, key part of their promise to voters uh, that brought them to office. And you can zoom all the way forward to 2022, uh, most recent Kishida speech to the Diet. I will take unprecedented measures to reduce the burden of electricity prices on households. So this is the kind of messaging that politicians in Japan today feel compelled to make. And that's a very different situation from the previous era when prices were raised very routinely, almost without much public communication at all. And if you look at the data, this is household electricity prices in Japan and compared to the rest of the world. Uh, Japanese prices, like I said, were the highest in the world in the 90s. But since then, they've mostly stagnated while the rest of the world has caught up. And this is primarily in response to climate change. A lot of countries are implementing surcharges on electricity, carbon taxes. So those prices are going up. Japanese prices have stayed just about where they were. Um, and these would be much lower, actually, if Japan hadn't faced higher fuel costs, uh, which I'll, I'll set aside. But if you subtract uh, fuel costs, Japan would be even lower down here. So electricity prices have, in relative terms, fallen. If you look at um, automobile-related taxes and fees, again, uh, up until the 90s, gasoline tax, automobile weight tax, highway tolls were all raised very routinely without much controversy. And then after that, this is when you have electoral reform. Uh, these all flatline, and the debate is mostly about we need to cut these and eliminate uh, these kinds of charges. This is a figure uh, that basically gives you a sense of the cost of owning a car in Japan. This is revenues from the automobile weight tax and the acquisition tax, so the money you have to pay to buy a car and own a car. Um, and the revenues have basically plummeted, right? So about 80% uh, for the acquisition tax and 40% for, uh, or so for the weight tax. So it's much cheaper now in Japan to buy and operate a car. And again, a car is typically not the most energy efficient transportation mode. So while the world is shifting towards trying to address climate change, Japan is moving towards making it easier to own a car and not go on the train, uh, encouraging more transportation, uh, and encouraging more energy use by households. 
In some ways, of course, this is a good thing, right? So maybe Japanese consumers are paying prices that were too high. And so, you know, it's hard to say normatively that this is all bad, but in terms of dealing with climate change, without question, this makes it harder for Japan to make progress. Um, and just to, you know, consider, is this something to do with the preferences of Japanese citizens changing? Uh, the World Value Survey has a uh, public opinion poll that they run occasionally on the question of, do you oppose environmental taxes? Uh, would you oppose giving up income for the environment? And they've run this in Japan between 1990 and 2005, and basically there's been no change. So it's not that Japanese citizens have changed their mind and become more skeptical about paying these taxes. They always didn't want to pay high gasoline taxes, but they weren't empowered politically to do much about it. But today politicians feel that if they keep these taxes high, the voters are going to punish them. And so it's almost like an Americanization of the Japanese political system. You know, in America, it's often said that the gasoline tax is the third rail of politics, right? If you touch the gasoline tax, you'll get electrocuted. And so the Japanese political system has moved a little bit more in that kind of direction. Now, of course, amidst all of this, you have uh, the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. Um, and I'm sure all of you remember this, uh, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake uh, created a 13 meter tsunami that completely inundated the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant site. And essentially the earthquake cut external power to the plant site and it's the tsunami that knocked out the backup power generators and made it inevitable uh, that there would be uh, a core meltdown. Um, and incidentally, the backup generators were underground because these were General Electric designed nuclear power plants and so they were concerned about tornadoes, right? So in the United States you worry about tornadoes. Uh, in Japan you want to worry about tsunamis, but they didn't change the design. If they had put the backup generators up on a hill, they could have avoided most of the problem. Um, but it was sort of a very classic case of, well, you know, that works over there, so let's bring it and design it exactly in the same way. Um, and you know, this is an event that leads to very serious questioning of the regulators and the managers, mostly related to METI in Japan. Um, I did some of my analysis um, with some colleagues, uh, and this came out in Environmental Science and Technology in 2013, where we looked at how prepared were these power plants relative to traditional tsunami heights. So we went and investigated what is the highest level of a tsunami that a particular site was hit with historically. We have pretty good data going back thousands of years on this. Um, and then we looked at, well, how high was the power plant and how high was the seawall? And really, it was re in these Japanese power plants, these yellow ones, where you have a bunch of power plants that were either not protected by a seawall or too low in height relative to tsunamis that were actually observed historically. And you didn't see this just about anywhere else. There were a few in the United States that um, had been hit by storm surges, but relative to tsunami, storm surges usually don't have the same force. So really, Japan was uniquely uh, vulnerable to this type of disaster. And if you go back to the kind of regulatory discussions that were going on, there was some awareness of this vulnerability, but the regulators didn't push hard partly because of the fact that METI and the utility companies were very much intertwined. Um, of course, you know, this is a human catastrophe of, uh, you know, an unimaginable proportions, but it was also a catastrophe for Japanese energy policy. Um, you can see here the contribution of nuclear energy to uh, Japanese energy supply basically goes to zero because the nuclear power plants are shut down and they're gradually coming back, uh, but it's unlikely that they'll go back to their full potential anytime soon. If you look at the energy mix, very similar story. Nuclear has shrunk to oblivion and what, what has Japan done to compensate? You would think, well, renewables is the obvious answer, but renewables have, has been relatively small and it's mostly things like coal, natural gas, and oil that have taken up the slack. Um, and this is a figure of renewable share in energy supply. And you see Japan is quite low. You, you have a pickup here after the DPJ passed a feed-in tariff uh, 
in uh, um, 2011 or 12, I believe. Uh, but you know, compared to the EU, where the increase is very rapid in renewals of adoption, Japan has been very slow, even behind the United States. Um, and the punchline here, of course, is that Japan, which used to be much better in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, this is in terms of per unit of economic output, you know, way ahead of everybody else, uh, has stagnated while Europe has caught up, the United States has made progress, and so Japan is not really at the forefront anymore. It's not terrible, uh, it's not the United States by any means, but it hasn't made progress for nearly two decades now. So is there a case for optimism? So this is sort of a disappointing, pessimistic kind of story. Uh, you know, can we, can we point to any good news? Well, I think there is a path to a more proactive climate policy for Japan. So in the current Japanese political system, there are roadblocks, but there are also potential uh, positives. So in the current Japanese political system, leadership matters a lot. The prime minister has much more authority than under the previous Japanese political system. So administrative reforms have centralized power. Uh, the prime minister has more influence. And I focus so far on what are called demand side policies, right? Basically raising prices on burning fossil fuels, burning gasoline to try to discourage energy use. But there are also supply side policies, right? Promoting renewable energy. Let's make energy from energy sources that don't emit carbon. Right? And if you do that, it doesn't matter what people are paying for energy. Right? If we're not emitting any carbon, then you can use as much energy as you like. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. But supply side policies are not as affected by these kinds of political changes. In pol public opinion surveys, if you ask Japanese citizens, do you care about climate change? They typically say, yes, this is the most important international issue. They just don't want to pay for it, right? <laughs> so, you know, there, there is a political context, a movement that you could conceivably think of, at least a, a rationale for uh, more support. The resistance uh, for proactive climate policy tends to come from actors like electric utility companies, TEPCO, energy intensive industry that's worried about uh, regulation, and uh, in some irony, I suppose, METI bureaucrats that are worried about the impact of uh, to proactive climate change policy on Japanese industrial competitiveness. But these are precisely the kinds of actors that in today's Japanese political system, the prime minister should be empowered to sidestep to some degree, to take the argument to the people and say, we're not gonna follow what the electric utilities want. We're gonna do something that's good for mitigating climate change. So public awareness and leadership from the top, it seems like, should be able to help Japan move forward on climate policy. I think the Abe government, in some ways, is the negative example here, which is to say I think Abe was a powerful prime minister and had the ability to do something about this, but he was personally not very invested in climate change. And I've heard this from people who've advised him and briefed him on climate. They were like, this guy cares about economic growth, he cares about security and making Japan great again. He does not care about the environment or climate change. Um, and I think his policies very much reflect this. Uh, so in 2018, I uh, published a piece with Trevor and Surti, uh, arguing that this was Abe Energinomics, right? So Abenomics was his economic policy to revive Japan's economy. And Abe's energy policy in many ways was subservient to that economic growth strategy is basically let's lower energy prices to try to boost the economy, and let's try to ignore as much as possible any kind of regulation that could slow down economic growth. Uh, METI had a very prominent role among the prime minister's inner circle. One of the first things Abe did when he became prime minister was he rolled back the DPJ's feed-in tariffs that was leading to a solar boom, right? Solar in Japan was taking off very dramatically. Some people called it a bubble, and they stopped that in their tracks. Um, the Abe government was very heavily criticized for supporting coal-fired power plants. Under the Abe government, Japan became the only G7 country to support coal construction both domestically and in its foreign aid program for developing countries. And its Paris Agreement target was widely criticized for essentially using accounting gimmicks to make their emissions reductions look more serious than they actually were. 
And the international NGO community certainly was paying attention. So this is the Climate Action Tracker, which tracks uh, emissions reduction pledges by various countries. So this is the last assessment uh, under the DPJ government in 2012 where it's assessed that Japan's climate change goals are sufficient. And it looks like you know, the, the emissions trend looks pretty good. And this is right after Abe comes to power. Goes all the way to inadequate. Uh, Japan is saying, actually, our emissions are going to increase now. Uh, and then maybe it'll start declining after you know, I'm, I'm going to be away from power. right? So um, the international NGO community very much saw through this. And Japan's reputation plummeted, right? So this is an expert evaluation of Japan's climate change policy by German Watch. Under the Abe government, Japan was routinely at the absolute bottom of international rankings in terms of seriousness about climate change policy making. So the Suga government, which came to power after Abe stepped down, looked like a moment of hope and a turning point, right? So if you follow Japanese politics, you might remember this, but when Suga came to power in 2020, he very prominently said climate change is one of our core missions, one of our core goals, and he increased the emissions reduction target for Japan all the way from 26% to 46% for 2030. And this is relatively soon, so that's a very ambitious target. Uh, he committed to a much higher renewables target um, and for the first time said, we're going to go to net zero in 2050. It's enshrined in law now. Uh, Japan was still uh, a bit addicted to coal, but there was some shift, some cancellation of projects. Um, but that said, a 2050 target imposes relatively limited accountability on current politicians. You could say, well, you know, in the future we'll do some good stuff. Um, but if you're not doing things now, then you're not going to get there. And at the end of the day, Suga only lasted about a year, so there wasn't much that happened under his government. The current government, the Kishida government, uh, has made public statements that seem promising in some sense. There's a continuation of Suga's policies. And, um, but on the other hand, uh, if you look at who has power in the government, the kind of people in the LDP who care about climate change, Suga himself, Kono, Koizumi, uh, have been sidelined. Right? So the people who committed to this big shift towards climate change mitigation in the previous government seem to be moved out of the picture to a significant degree. Um, Kishida has said that he wants to promote nuclear. Uh, so under Kishida, they've declared that they want to start the construction of new nuclear power plants. So this is new, right? So they've been talking about uh, restarting existing plants, but for the first time, the government is saying we might consider the construction of new power plants. I'm skeptical that this will actually happen because the political opposition is still intense, but public opinion surveys indicate maybe the Japanese public is now ready to at least consider this possibility of new, power, uh, new nuclear power plants. Nonetheless, uh, Kishida was the one that was awarded this Fossil of the Day award uh, by making a COP26 speech supporting thermal power generation. And if you look at the actual policy track record, when the war in Ukraine happened, uh, Kishida's main policy response was to provide a subsidy for oil wholesalers to keep a lid on gasoline prices. So the idea was, let's keep gasoline prices as low as possible to cushion the shock for Japanese consumers. In other countries, uh, there was a policy move towards, let's transform our energy sector and make us less reliant on fossil fuels. That was not the Japanese response. Um, and the Kishida government is also criticized for trying to maintain their economic interest in natural gas projects in Russia, in Sakhalin. And you know, this doesn't look like it's actually going to materialize, but they, uh, they didn't want to let that go uh, as quickly as others had encouraged them to. So I'll just close on a few broader implications. Um, so recently, I, I published an article with several co-authors in the journal Science um, that draw some lessons from the Japanese experience. And you know, the punchline here is that variation in political institutions uh, might explain some of the variation we see in the kind of energy transitions countries pursue. And we identify three broad models of energy transition. Transition, uh, transition through insulation, in which politicians have a relatively free hand because they're insulated uh, from 
for example, backlash from consumers, as we saw in the early phase of Japanese energy conservation policy. Another model is through compensation, in which the losers of energy trans transition are compensated. So we see this in Germany, for example, where coal miners are given relatively uh, good benefits to shift into other sectors of the economy. And then the final model is transition through markets, which is basically the government gives up and sort of lets, let's let the market figure this out, which is to a large extent the American policy with some variation depending on the administration. But the punchline is that there's no one size fits all solution and policy solutions need to be targeted appropriately to the political context. And here I would say that the United States and Japan face similar kinds of challenges. National level political institutions in both countries today make insulation difficult, right? So raising electricity prices would be quite difficult politically in both countries, gasoline prices. But compensation is also difficult. Japan and the United States don't have robust welfare states or corporatism, which in European countries can help to compensate the losers of economic transitions. Demand side transitions, as I suggested, are difficult in both countries because of these political institutions. So what's the solution? It's probably focus on subsidies for things like innovation, new technologies, um, you know, there are also a fair bit of relatively low or even negative cost energy efficiency measures like insulating your house, right? Actually has net negative cost oftentimes because you save more on electricity and heating over the long run, but you need a little bit of an incentive up front because people don't have the capital to invest in those kinds of renovations. So those kinds of policies might be uh, easier to do. Removing barriers to market-based transitions. So today, renewables are actually cheaper in many cases than fossil fuels. And so in a case like that, in a market-based system, you should let the market do its thing and try to remove regulations and barriers to installing renewables. And of course, empowering the local level. Uh, we've seen this in California and the United States for many years with fuel economy standards and uh, carbon uh, reduction targets, Tokyo. Uh, has played a little bit of this role in Japan, but even if national level institutions uh, make transitions difficult, there could be different institutional setups at the local level that can help. So final slide, conclusion is basically Japan's old model of energy conservation is no longer viable. Um, and perhaps in some ways that's a good thing, right? So the old model imposed very high costs on the ordinary Japanese consumer and it was also subject to a fair deal of corruption. And so maybe it was a good thing that it went away. Um, and Japanese energy policy stagnation reflected the dismantling of that old system. But the problem was it wasn't replaced with anything concrete. And so one question that I'd like to end on is what should the new Japanese model look like? Because I think the issue here is that Japan doesn't have a new energy or climate change model that has been really functional and effective. Um, it seems like the core ingredients would need to be personal prioritization by the prime minister. So, so Suga uh, and many of his allies like Kono or Koizumi may come to office and say, I want to make this a key issue. Just like Abe made Abenomics a key issue and made a lot of those reforms happen. So that kind of personal leadership by prime ministers could matter a lot. Public buy-in, of course, is also important. So consumers in Japan are probably going to be opposed to energy cost increases, but they do care about climate change. And so making the case that the, these are the kinds of policies that are necessary to make progress to the public and make it more likely that voters in Japan will be willing to cast a vote based on climate issues instead of pocketbook issues might help. And finally, the focus should probably be on subsidies rather than imposing costs. Uh, focus on supply side policies rather than demand side policies, as I talked about. And finally, if you look at global climate uh, CO2 emissions, uh, Japan is at this point a minor player, right? The vast majority of emissions are coming from China. In the future, they're going to come from India and Africa in the next phase. And so, making sure that that economic development is rapid, but also environmentally sustainable by moving the needle on innovation. Japan has a lot of great 
promising technologies, whether it be in biofuels or in hydrogen fuel cell technologies, and making sure that those technologies become available and providing those kinds of technologies through foreign aid rather than support for things like coal-fired power plants would also be an important part of Japan's contributions. So with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.